welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. You know why? Because I need God. But I'm praying for you because you need God too. So I want you to stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come to hear from a man or a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives tonight. That when we walk out of this place tonight, we will never be the same because the spirit of the Lord has spoken to us. We thank you for blessing us now. But Lord, we would ask that you not only bless us, but bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are meeting tonight and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers, there are sisters. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. The Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, our Catholic brothers and sisters, the Adventist brothers and sisters, Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, The Way, Lord, uh, San Bernardino Temple, whatever church preaching the gospel out there, Lord, there are brothers and sisters. Bless them as you would bless us, and Lord will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty, mighty, mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives this night. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Go with me to the book of Daniel. One of my favorite characters in Scripture is this young man named Daniel. I remember many years, probably 25, 30 years ago, I taught the book of Daniel, line upon line, precept upon precept, and it changed my life. I was so impressed with the very character of Daniel that I've never forgotten what takes place. You see, Daniel is a story, if you will, about a young man, yes, but it's really a story about you. And all of these scriptures that we're going to tonight are illustrations and examples of what took place in the physical in the Old Testament so that you can be that way in the spiritual in the New Testament. You live in New Testament times. We can learn how to live life. We can learn how to do life. This is, if you will, the Bible, the manual for life. This tells you about how to have a great marriage. This tells you and shows you how to have great children that grow in the ways of the Lord. This manual of life called the Bible shows you how to be a great employee, a great employer. Much to most people's surprise, it'll even show you how to be extremely economically wealthy. It's right in the scriptures. God cares about your economic condition. But more importantly, God truly loves you enough that he wants to bless you. Now let me say this to you again. A lot of people wonder and hope that God will bless them when in fact the very inside of the heartbeat of God, which is one of the things that we teach, we don't just teach the word of God, we teach the character, nature, and attributes of God. You take the word of God, you mix it together with the character, nature, and attributes of God, and then you've got now the heartbeat of God, and the heartbeat of God is what gets on the inside of you and changes you to be that great husband or that great wife, uh, to raise the right family, to make the right decisions, to be in the right place so you can get the right blessings. That's what this is really all about. I mean, if you're going to live on this planet, you might as well live blessed. I'm not talking about being happy in every area. I'm not talking about just money in your pocket. That would be silly. Because you can have a lot of money in your pocket and still not be blessed. But living a significant life where there's purpose and meaning and destiny and reason while you're here on the planet. It's found in the scripture. 
And when you follow your life according to what's being displayed in Scripture, it now no longer just becomes an Old Testament story. Now it becomes a revelation of how you and I and can conduct ourselves in order to get in the line of the blessings of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. I don't want to just, just plug along in life. I don't want to just have a mediocre marriage. I, uh, you know, and I don't. I have a marriage after all these years, you know, 12 grandchildren later of, of loving my wife more today than I ever loved her when we first got married and her feeling the same way about me. And the kids all serving the Lord. I mean, it's a great testimony as we go into the word of the Lord, all because we took the word and applied it. Now, wait a minute. I can't make you take the word and apply it in your life. Only you can make those choices. But I can, for being a loving pastor that cares about you, present the word in such a way that you can easily grab a hold of some basic, simple principles to apply them in your life and get extremely blessed. And then you move into deeper water, you know. Then you start to really get going in the Word of God and start prospering in areas to help other people to prosper. And that's what life's really all about. There's five things I'm going to share with you tonight that I saw in Scripture quickly as I went through the Word of God today in the book of Daniel. Characteristics that impressed God. If I, if I was a person was out, I, I, I want to be, obviously, God's, you know, here's this whole text on a guy named Daniel. He obviously impressed God. Characteristic that impressed God, I want to know what it is in that life that so impressed God that God blesses him. God meets his needs. God, is, while he's out on the limb, God holds the tree up. While he's doing what he's doing that's absolutely bizarre, God backing him in every area of his life. I want to know what it is that does that. Because I see a lot of people call themselves Christians and their lives are mundane and boring and it doesn't look like there's any God in their life at all. And you find them giving up on really God and, you know, God is something but not everything. And they go from an excitement to God to cooling off because they don't get answers to prayer things that take place in their life, and they just really are not the Christians that God, they need to be and that God wants them to be and that God paid the price for them to be. Five quick things that we'll find in Scripture about Daniel that causes him to be one that was so outstanding that God blessed him. Now, obviously, he impressed God. Now, I want you to know something. If this young man can impress God in his circumstances, you can impress God in your circumstances. I don't care if you live in downtown San Bernardino. Because his condition is a whole lot worse than yours will ever be. Let me take you back and give you an illustration. In the year 605 B.C., 605 B.C., that's a long time ago. <laughs> it's called the first Babylonian captivity. There were three of them. The first one, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a ruling, reigning monarch that was crazy. <laughs> absolutely, he breathed and people either lived or died. He was absolutely insane. But a genius on the one hand, crazy as can be on the other. Thought of himself as a god himself. He's going to take Jerusalem captive and all the Jews that are in Israel. And this is called the first Babylonian captivity. And the reason for it is because the Jewish nation just would not hear God's word and do it. They went through a bunch of systems. They went through religious acts. They went through a bunch of stuff, you know, like we can get in the church. We're all religious in our approach to the things of God, but never really having a heart from, for God. And God lets them get taken into captivity to teach them a lesson. That you can't mess with God. We ought to just learn that right there. If you just learn that tonight, you're going to be happy. And so we find that Nebuchadnezzar is really smart. And if he's going to take this whole country, and I don't know about you, if you take a whole country and bring them back to your nation and use them as slaves, and that's what he wanted to do, he's going to have to figure out how to manage those slaves. So he goes in and they take about 70 young leaders. That's during the period of time. These 70 young leaders are all the wisest and smartest young men. They're like mid-teens, young men. 
Nebuchadnezzar goes in, takes the 70, wins the battle, leaves everybody in place, takes the 70 back to Babylon. He's going to train the 70 to be his mouthpiece and his arms and an extension of education for the next group of people he brings and then the final group of people he brings, which he does. But these 70 are going to be the leaders. In the 70, there are, if you will, about 66 compromised men in, in these 70. But there are four outstanding men and one very outstanding. You heard the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three were tremendous in their relationship with God. And then there was one by the name of Daniel. And Daniel was outstanding. He put his life on the line for the things of God. If he died, he died. If he didn't, he didn't. And that's what it's going to take for all of us to be successful with God. Listen to me. You may not have your life threatened like Daniel being in lion's den or Nebuchadnezzar coming after you or all the religious people trying to kill you. No, nah, that'll never happen, but it'll cost you your life going for God. And you're going to have to understand that. You give up what you think, what you have, and you get into what God has for you. That's what this is all about. And we find that Daniel does that. And there are four outstanding characteristics of Daniel that every single one of us, by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of every one of us that are here that call ourselves Christians, that we could operate in ourselves that would also impress God and get God on your side when you need him the most. And that's worth listening to. Are you hearing me? Let's take a look at it just for a second. Let's go. Here's, if you will, if you're going to impress God, impress God with godly control is number one. Godly control means you control your emotions by the power of God. You control your feelings. You control your wants. You control your desires. You control your own justification why life is the way it is. And you go for God and you put God first. And so when I make this statement, impress God with godly control, all of us are going to be tempted in our life to get out of sync with God and go for what we want instead of from what God wants. Yeah. And when you go for what you want, even though you feel you deserve it, instead of going for what God wants, you are now no longer in godly control. Your self-control has now gone to self and it will never please God. And what we do that is all the time, we will be tested as Christians all the time. In other words, there will be something comes up in your business, something comes up in your marriage, something comes up in your job where you could prosper from it, but it's just a little bit tainted off and it's just a little bit wrong and you can get away with it. Nobody will ever know, but God will see it and God will know. And when you keep yourself in godly control, that you're self-controlled by the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you, then all of a sudden you catch and impress God. And Daniel did that. He's brought from his nation with these other, you know, 70 young men. What was the traveling like from Jerusalem to Babylon? It must have been horrific. They were treated as royalty of some sort, but... You know, what was the water like? What was the food like? What was the heat like? What was the sweat like? What was the bugs like? What was the sleeping conditions as they traveled from Jerusalem to Babylon? What was the food like? What was life like? Here's this teenage probably boy, and he's left his mom, he's left his dad, he's left his home, he's left his bed, he's left everything. All of his friends are gone and forever and ever. All of his hopes, his dreams, everything is, is shut down, everything is stopped. He's now by himself with 70 men, most of which are probably strangers to him, and he has no concept of anything. Everything he ever wanted is gone, everything he ever dreamt of is gone, every comfort he ever had was gone and the first thing the king does is he offers him food from the king's table you know there's that old saying the way to a man's heart is through his stomach 
Nebuchadnezzar coined that. Did you know that? No. <laughs> but it's probably the same kind of a principle, isn't it? And Nebuchadnezzar comes along, so here he is, he's probably starving. Here he is, he's down, depressed, discouraged. He's lost everything, lost his parents, lost his home, lost his roof, lost his future, lost his destiny, lost his dreams, lost everything. And he's in this strange, incredibly crazy country, really not knowing what's going to happen to him. And all of a sudden, it's offered to all of the 70. Now here's Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, I'm going to win them onto my side by offering him the king's food and the king's wine. There isn't anybody that's going to resist that. I owe it to myself. I should have the king's food. I need the king's food. I've been starving for days. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what I've done. I've lost everything. Give me the food. Give me the wine. I deserve it. And 66 of them did that. But these four guys were different, especially Daniel. In your life, there's going to be a lot of temptations that are going to try to get you off course with God. In your life, in my life, there'll be a lot of testing that God sits back and watches to whether or not you're going to operate according to him or the feelings you have of the world. But if I just did this, I will gain this. Yes, but if you do it, you will lose that little thing you had called oneness with God. And when we compromise our position, don't we all at times, what we do is we end up failing the big test. We have to go through it over and over again until we finally get to the place where God is so important that I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do, even if it's going to cost me a life. I want you to go with me to the first chapter of Daniel, verse number 8. First chapter of Daniel, verse number 8. We're talking about godly control. He's offered this food. But Daniel purposed in his heart, verse number eight, that he should not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacy. Stop right there. He saw that the king was trapping him and going to defile him. You have got to see that sometimes life's going to come along and look good to you, but it's not going to be God. And not everything that looks good is God. Is anybody listening? And you've got to weigh these things out and check out what really is God instead of what just looks good. I mean, did that food look good to him? Did that, did that meal look good to him? Did the, but he saw it as something different than what it looked like. Did he deserve it? Could he have justified having it? Absolutely. But he saw it as something different. Listen, the portion of the king's delicacies. And then he comes along and he makes this statement, nor with the wine in which he drank. Therefore, he requested to the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. His life was on line. Even the eunuch's life was on line. The eunuch was somebody who was castrated in order to follow the king's laws. And if the eunuch said yes to him, you can defile yourself, not defile yourself, and eat a different food than the king told you. The king said you're to eat this. And if he finds out about it, I'm going to die and you're going to die, Daniel. His life was on the line, but God was backing him. You will be in a position of compromise in your life over and over and over again. Sometimes it'll bring personal gain to you, but you'll lose a relationship with God and you've got to weigh whether or not it really is good or it's really God. And he knew he could control himself from what he thought he wanted and needed and he did what was right before his very eyes. Somebody ought to say amen. And for all of us that are in here, if we want to prosper in life, we're going to have to be people that realize these tests are coming at us from different places all the time. Number two, we're talking about characteristics that impress God. Number two, if you're going to impress God, you're going to have to do it with some spiritual backbone. You know, bottom line, you're going to have to have some courage. And someone needs to talk to you. This sissy Christianity just really doesn't get the job done. In order for you to get the job done, and I'm not talking about you not being kind. Of course you need to be kind. And of course you need to be loving. And of course you don't need to be aggressive to these places. But you also need to stand up against stuff that is wrong. And you should not just let the wrong beat you from pillar to post. And you're going to have to have a spiritual backbone called some courage. 
And we see that Daniel has that in the fifth chapter. Go with me to Daniel in the fifth chapter, verse number 22 of the fifth chapter. And let me give you a scenario about what's taking place here. And we find that the one that's on the throne is no longer a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the crazy ruling monarch of the time, but his great-grandson now, Belteshazzar, is on the throne. He is nuts. He is a drunken weirdo. And I have to tell you the, how this works. Let me give you an illustration of what takes place. When they took the children and all the children out of Israel, they raided the temple of, of Israel, and they took all the golden goblets, all the sacred instruments out of the temple, and they brought them to Babylon. And here you will find that Belteshazzar, now Nebuchadnezzar never touched them, but Belteshazzar breaks open the instruments, and he starts to drink wine from the instruments, and he has a drunken orgy. Now, that's bad enough, but he, in his thinking, lives in a city that is an impregnable city. Now, what I mean by impregnable city is that Babylon was considered to be a city that nobody could ever penetrate. I don't know how big your army is, no matter how strong your army is, you will never get past the walls of Babylon and you will never get in here. Nobody has for hundreds of years and this is a solid, impregnable city. The Medo-Persians are camped outside. The Medo-Persians. Daniel is now an older man. And he is kind of put away on the shelf, but everybody knows him as one who can read visions and understand things that other people don't understand. He's really been a, a really spiritual leader of all of the Babylonian area and territory. People really do respect him. Belteshazzar himself, the king, respects him, but he's in this drunken orgy. And you might remember what happens as a hand, a hand, H-A-N-D, comes down from heaven. Can you imagine? How freaky is this? What are you drinking and smoking that a hand comes down <laughs> from heaven, you know? Uh, uh, a hand comes down from heaven and starts to write on the wall. Some of you have seen that, I'm sure, as you did acid when you were younger. And, uh, 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 and <laughs> don't give me an amen on that one, brother. And uh, so they start to write on the wall. This hand writes on the wall, and nobody can interpret the writing. So they finally, you know, they try everybody who can interpret what that, those words mean. So they go get Daniel. And Daniel's an older guy, man. He's like me. He doesn't give a flip what people think of him anymore. He's already gone past that. You know, you left cool 20 years ago. You understand what I'm talking about? Anybody that's anywhere near my age understands what I'm talking about. That's why you wear the same clothes every day. And uh, <laughs> you don't give a flip, you know what I'm saying? Look at the husbands. I see you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're all there. I mean, if we have five things in our closet, that's enough. And so here's Daniel. He's at that age, you know, and he's, as he's at this age, it's really, really uh, a, a thing. They call Daniel in to interpret the handwriting on the wall. And when he does, you talk about spiritual backbone. If he speaks out of line to this king, now there's some pressure on this king because the Medo-Persians are going to bust through the wall any day. At least they're going to try to. He doesn't think they're going to and uh, doesn't think they can but at least the pressure. So he gets drunk, has this drunken orgy in the middle of the drunken orgy. The writing's on the wall. They call Daniel to interpret the writing. Before Daniel interprets the writing, he gets up in. You know what I'm talking about, getting up in? He gets up in the king's face. And I just wanted you to see this because this really t this tickles me like crazy. Verse number 22, if you will, of the fifth, fifth chapter of Daniel. But you, his son, Belteshazzar, talking about the son of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, really his great-grandson. He says, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of the house uh, before you. Those are the vessels they drink to them. And you and the lords and your wives and your concubine have drank wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood and iron and stone and which did you did not see or hear or know. And God who holds your breath in his hands and owns your ways, you have not glorified. You know the bottom line, I will never ever follow somebody that won't tell me like it is. 
And I love this Daniel. He's got a spiritual backbone. He is not afraid of this king that could open his mouth and have him slaughtered at that very moment. And he makes this statement to the king. He says, you haven't even known those gods that you worship. You don't even know them. You never heard from them. You worship the god of gold and silver and prestige and power and man's recognition. You know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, there's one who holds your breath in his hand. And there's one who owns all of your ways. Tonight, listen to me right now. There's one that holds your breath in his hands. And you and I need to glorify him. And the thing that really gets me about this is that oftentimes we don't realize that the God we're talking about, there's a God who gives you the air to breathe, it gives you the land to walk on, gives you the food to eat, the rain to fight, holds the sun and the moon at it. We ought to glorify God. And here comes Daniel. Don't you think that impressed God? Daniel, wait a minute, don't you know better? Shut up, man, the guy's drunk. He's having a bad night. I just wrote something on the wall that confused him. He could just tell you off and have you cut in pieces right now. And there's no supreme court. There's no, uh, you know, there's no CIA protection. There's no FBI protection. There's no local police. If the king speaks, you die. Daniel doesn't give a flip. When are you and when am I going to not give a flip about what people think, but glorify every day the God who holds our breath in his hand? Number three, we're talking about what's about Daniel that made him so impressive to God that God just blesses him and backs him. Number three, listen to this. Impress God by living a faithful life. And what I mean by faithful life, I'm talking about a life of integrity. Being faithful. You say it, that's the way it is, even if you have to swear to your own hurt. But a faithful life. You'll find Daniel in the sixth chapter, some amazing things are taking place. We find that Daniel now is, is um, under the rulership of the Medo-Persian. The Medo-Persian's name is Darius. He is, he is now the king over it. Bel- uh, Nebuchadnezzar, don't lose me now. Nebuchadnezzar's gone, died off. His son, great-grandson, Belteshazzar, has died off. He's, that night, by the way, he interpreted the ra- handwriting on the wall. I have this uh, picture of this painted by Rembrandt on my living room uh, wall. And Rembrandt painted a picture of the hand coming down and the drunken orgy with the, with the vessels and everything. And I have that on in my living room. And uh, it's so fascinating because at that moment, he interprets it. Here's what he interprets. And I always loved this painting so much that I was so thrilled to get it in my house because it said something every day to me. I never want to be weighed, found too light, and God couldn't use me. And that's what he said. You have been weighed, Belteshazzar, been found too light, and then tonight is your last night because the Medo-Persians are coming through that wall. And don't you know, God brought them, and now a new Medo-Persian comes up as the king. His name is Darius. He loves Daniel. He has heard of Daniel. God has given him favor. God has blessed this young man. Now he's an old man like me. And now, you know, and he's just got done all these things. And he is, his reputation has gone before him. And Darius just loves him. So they think they're going to trap Daniel. You see, there's people in the land that don't like Daniel because he's a godly man. And they're supposed to be godly people, but they're not. So they'll go to Darius and they say, Darius, How about if everybody for 30 days that worships or sings songs or prays to any other God but you should be killed? Thrown into the lion's den and eaten alive by the lions. I want you to know something. When they tried to find something wrong about Daniel to accuse him to Darius, here's what they found out. He was a faithful man of integrity and there was nothing they could find that was wrong about him. Let's check it out. Will you check it out with me? Because this is our point number three. Daniel 6, chapter, verse number four. And the governors and the satraps, these are all the spiritual leaders, sought to find some charges against Daniel 
concerning the kingdom. But they could know, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Wow. They couldn't find anything wrong with him to get him, and that's the way they ought to say about you. And that's what they ought to say about me. Check me out all you want. You're not going to find anything. I'm just a man that's serving God. I'm a man loving my family, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead. That's the way it ought to be with you. There ought to be no signs of evil in you and in your past. If it's in the past, let God destroy it. Let God eliminate it. But don't stay around there. Let's move on in the areas of integrity and being faithful with God. Come on, somebody. We're talking about impressing God. Because it's the characteristics. Number four, impress God by being a person of prayer. I can't tell you how important this is to me, especially recently. I was sharing with my staff, this is going to shock you. Are you ready? This is going to shock you. I have never had an answer to prayer in my entire life life the way that I thought it should have been answered and in the timing it should have been timed. I have never had an answer prayer that way. But all of my prayers have been answered. Never the way I thought. Never within the time scope I thought it should be. You sitting in this building tonight and you watching by internet all over the world, you are an answer to prayers 15 years ago. You didn't even know. Some of you said, wait a minute, I was only four. Doesn't matter how old you were, God was setting you to be up here right now today in this place. And you are an answer to prayer. It never happened. Never has happened. I never got an answer to prayer the way I thought it ought to come, the way it ought to come, and the timing that I thought it should come, but it always comes. He has never let me down. Listen to this old man. He has never let me down. And the prayers are much greater answered than I ever thought they'd be. Some of you need to understand by being a person of prayer doesn't mean you get prayer immediately. It means it's going to happen when it happens. God's in control of the time. Time is not in control of God. If time was in control of God, then God would be submissive to the time. Therefore, God can stop the time and do whatever he wants. Nothing he's he's submissive to. So he controls the time. Time doesn't control him. And that's why he doesn't always answer prayers within your time frame. But he'll always answer the prayer. Hold on. God's coming through. (laughs) Is anybody listening? So number four, we we see Daniel. Now this, remember I talked about I talk about having a spiritual backbone. This also fits into that too, but he's a man of prayer. So they can't find any fault in Daniel. They want to trap him. They want to get him. Anybody that's found praying to some other God uh, for the next 30 days. Now you and I, you know what we would be like. Well, I, I, I could keep on praying. I'm just going to close my door. I'll pray in my prayer closet. Nobody will know. I'll keep praying. Daniel is different. Don't you know he just impressed God? Listen to what the word of the Lord says. You're right there anyway in the sixth chapter. Go down there with me, if you will. And uh, verse number 10. And Daniel knew that, the, knew that the writing was signed. In other words, the king signed it into law about nobody worshiping any other God for 30 days or they're going to die. And he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, He knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God and as his custom since the early days. They finally assembled against Daniel. They take Daniel out, throw him in the lion's den. God fills up the lions. They all fall asleep or whatever. Darius the king is nervous all night long. He can't sleep. He likes this Daniel. Doesn't want him eaten, but there's no way these lions are not going to eat this man. He runs out the next morning, lifts off the lid of this lion's pit, and here's Daniel sitting there saying, I said, time for breakfast, Jack. 
Could I have a McMuffin? <laughs> Starbucks. Frappuccino tall. Whatever, you know. <laughs> Because he's a man of prayer, God backs him. Last one for tonight, and I'll finish with this. Just five little things that are just custom for you today on how to impress God. Number five, impress God with humility. Humility isn't taking a low road of being a beaten down nobody, driving a little messed up car that's got bumper stickers about Jesus all over it and smoke piling out of it and everybody thinking you're so spiritual because you have nothing. You're not spiritual, you're just stupid. <laughs> Humility is when you are dependent on God. It's not talking about when you are a low lifer with God. Is anybody listening? There's a big difference between being a low lifer and uh, one who is dependent. One who is dependent says, God, I need you. It's all about you. Everything I have is yours. Everything I'll ever have, you give me. Every door that's ever open, you open. Every door that's ever closed, you close, God. Anything I'll ever be, anything I'll ever go, any place I'll ever see, anything I'll ever say, it's all about you, God. I need you. You be glorified in this house, the house that you built, and it's talking about yourself. That's humility. Dependency on God not low-life living. Is everybody listening? And you see that with Daniel. He's praying, and as he's praying, an angel appears in the 10th chapter to him. Shocks the snot out of him. Some of you think, well, what's so big about that? How about in the middle of the night, you start praying and have an angel appear in your bedroom? I think some of you would wet your pants right there. It's called diaper time. And you know what I'm talking about, man. Some big old angel looking down at you. Okay. This is a flashback from drugs, I know. <laughs> this angel comes to him and starts to talk to him. And he's, I mean, he's like, if you read the passages before and afterwards, he's like totally blown away like any of us would be. He's weak, he's down, he can't even talk. He, the angel comes and touches him to strengthen him. And he finally speaks to this angel. And he says this in the 10th chapter, verse 17. Daniel, the 10th chapter, verse 17. For now, he says, for how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now nor is there any breath left in me. In other words, it's not about me. How can I even speak to you? I'm a nobody. You're everything, and I need you. And he touches him and strengthens him in order to talk. Four, five things tonight that impress God. Simple things that you and I can all do. Number one, we need to have self-control by having godly control. You're going to be tempted. You're going to have things come your way that are going to keep you away. And you can compromise by trying to get it because you need it, right? Justify it because, you know, it's been a long time since you had it. Now you brought it. And call it God when it's not God at all. You need to watch yourself and be godly controlled. Number two, you need to be a person of spiritual backbone. Someone with some courage to face the future. Yes, you will be under attack. You will find that in Daniel's life, it never stopped as great as he was. That's why the Bible makes it very clear that just shall live by faith. I hate that. I want to have lots of money and have no problems. But the just shall live by faith. <laughs> that means you can't see it. You got to trust God for it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. I hate that. I want to see it, count it, know where I'm going and what's going on. And every day I'm going to have to cast my cares, have the courage to face up that God's in control and not me. Come on, somebody. Number three, we learn this. We got to live a faithful life of integrity. 
Don't let people find stuff out about you. Don't, in fact, don't do anything and nobody will find anything out about you. Don't hide it, just don't do it. Then you don't have to worry about anything. Then they find stuff that you didn't do. And it doesn't last, it's just a bunch of liars. Some dude on the internet calls me all kinds of names all the time. I looked into it, found out he's a pastor of another church. He only got 30 people in his church. Uh, so consider the source. You know, bless him and move on. Not going to find out anything. You know what his problem was with me? I win souls. <laughs> and he put me in with Billy Graham. I'm in the same category as Greg Glory. I'm in there with Charles Swindell. I told Debbie I finally made the big time here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless God. Life is good, isn't it? What number were we on? Number four. We learn by being a prayer person. You're not going to get answers to your prayer right away. Why would you get answers right away? Sometimes you might. Sometimes you might. That's just the grace of God. But the rest of you are setting up tomorrow with your prayers today. It's the way it works. Listen to this. How to impress God with humility, number five. Everything you have, everything you'll ever be, everything you'll ever do, everything you'll ever say, anything that you ever get, people pat me on the back, it's got to go to my head. My head is named Jesus. That's what it's all about. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. See that? Good word, huh? I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God. Could I ask you all to remain seated just for a moment? It's only a quarter after, so we're really early. So let me have your attention for a few moments. You can't pick your kids up anyway right now. They're right in the middle of an altar call themselves. So just wait just a moment and listen to me just for a few seconds, and I'll let you go in just a minute. I want to make sure that all of you are all right with God before you leave. There's no way in the world you can come in and sing a song, clap your hands, hear the word of God. You know God spoke to you tonight. And listen, and then walk out of this place. How horrible would this be? Your heart stops and you die, and you open your eyes in hell. Nothing could be worse than that. But listen to me, what I'm going to say to you. I want to make sure you're right with God, and if anything should happen to you, and by the way, there's going to come a time when every one of us are going to leave this planet and face God. When that time comes, whether it's short or long, I want to make sure you're going to heaven. So I want you to listen to what I have to say. Because I'm going to tell you something that maybe you never knew before. You cannot get to heaven because you think you're a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say positive thinkers get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible and you're not going to make it. You cannot go to heaven because you are good. If you think you're a good person, you're going to make it because you're good or nice. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible because you're good or nice. You're not gonna make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can go to heaven because you're good or nice. Some of you might think to yourself you're gonna go to heaven because you know who Jesus is. But I want you to hear me right now. Even the devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven. Your head knowledge and mental acknowledgement about who Jesus is is not gonna get you to heaven. I already know you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas, you celebrate Easter every year of your life. You know who Jesus is, but that won't get you to heaven. You cannot get to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian. You're not gonna make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not gonna make it. Because I tell you this, because your mom and dad call you a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Listen, they could have taken you to catechism class or Sunday school class or Sabbath school class, put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, but that doesn't make you a Christian, even though you wore it. What makes you a Christian is simply as this. Jesus comes in John 3rd chapter to a man by the name of Nicodemus. And he tells this man, Nicodemus, you must be born again. 
Immediately when I use the words born again, it turns a lot of people off because Hollywood, movies, television, books, magazine have portrayed born again people as crazy, fanatical, and weirdos. But that's not what I'm talking about. Born again means something. When Jesus said this statement, in order for you to go to heaven, you must be born again. He said these words also, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there Jesus' way. And Jesus said, Jesus said, hear me now, Jesus said you must be born again. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down. All or nothing, and I'll prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. We don't know when, but we know he is. It might even be tonight. But he goes on to say, when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That is a crude, rude statement. But Jesus made the statement, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Who's he vomiting? Lukewarm people. Lukewarm, what's that mean? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. Are you hearing me? You're not against God? Oh no, here's lukewarm. But you're not wholehearted for God. He's just something. And I want you to hear me. If you live that kind of a life, you can call yourself a Christian all you want. You are not saved and you're not going to go to heaven. And somebody needs to love you, respect you enough to tell you the truth. Stop playing games, stop playing church. And today I love you to tell you the truth. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. I emphasize the word give. You know why the word give? Because he's not going to steal it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. It's your heart and life. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here tonight. This is a divine appointment you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments with plumbers and attorneys and doctors and dentists, but guess what? You've got a divine appointment with God tonight. God brought you here to get right with him, to hear the truth. And tonight is your night of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God and give him all of my heart? And give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven so I don't go to hell? How do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. It'll sound like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! It'll sound like that. Bang! When you hear that sound, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. When you raise your hand, what you're saying is, I, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I want to give him all of my heart and life. Tonight is your night. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people who've never given them all of your life, you know who you are, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I, I'm just not sure if I've ever really given him all of my heart. I'm not sure if I've really ever given him all of my life. Tonight is your night. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, in the foyer by television, out there in the food court, if you're down there in the plaza, wherever you're at, on the campus, that you hear my voice, get ready before God. Put your hand up and then put it right back down. Simple as that. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed. You're going to have to have some courage, some spiritual backbone to get right with God. You're going to have to have some spiritual backbone to get right with God and get the blessings of God. So guess what? It's going to take some courage on your part. But I won't embarrass you. Tonight is your night of salvation. Listen, it's more important that God sees you 
instead of what people see. Who cares what people see? God needs to see you raise your hand and care enough about him to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. I've done my job tonight. Now it's your turn to get right with God. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Thank you. Back here, 60. Thank you. 17. Thank you. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Thank you. 27 of the family room, 28, 29. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's like 25, 26, 27. Anybody else? 28. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick, if you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should, you should. Even online, if you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I give God all my heart, you can. I, I don't know what color the tab is. Does anybody know what color the tab is? Blue? Is it blue? You can push that blue tab, and I'll lead you in a prayer that you can invite Jesus in your heart and give him all your heart and all of your life. Anybody else? There's 25 of you. Anybody? Anybody real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 25 people. Here's what I want you to do. About 25 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. Is that okay? Get a friend if you need a friend. Come on, nudge your guy next to you and say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. Get in the aisle. Nobody leaves here in this period of time. Come down the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Come on, I'll come on, come on. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Come on, come on, come on. Every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way. Come on, home. In me. Come on, home. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, home. I give you my so I'll live for you alone every breath that I take. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? All of you in front put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, you're not like you're going to drop over and go to the morgue. You're going to heaven. <laughs> this is a cool thing, okay? Real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name's Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Only when Pastor Luke is it weird in this place. But uh, everything is cool today because he's not in the pulpit. And so guess what? Here's what we want you to do. He's going to pray with you. only takes a few moments. Give you free stuff to take home. Read about what to do next. And then introduce you to a program we have that will help you get strong in Jesus. Listen, that means you're going to meet somebody for five weeks in a row. They're going to go over scripture with you a little bit before church service. This is a good part. They're going to spend some money on you. Buy you coffee, tea, or nachos. Pray with you during the week. Encourage you five weeks. At the end of the five weeks, we'll give you all kinds of wonderful gifts. We'll give you a Bible, a rock Bible. It's worth like, I don't know how many, a billion dollars. And uh, uh, we'll just love you a lot. And then here's what I'm asking. If you'll give us one year of your life, we'll give back to you a life forever and ever and ever that'll be so powerful. You'll be a blessing, winning souls, changing your family, changing life. You said you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Why not do it here at The Rock? You just give us a one year. In one year's period of time, you will be a leader in helping others if you'll let us help you. But the first part is only five weeks with a spiritual personal trainer. And it's your call, your choice, but I encourage you to do that. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave right over this one. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.